when you send your cryptocurrency to a third party exchange, how do they actually store your digital assets? What goes on behind the scenes to make sure that your crypto doesn't get confused with someone else? And what's yours remains yours. Just as importantly, how is it possible for you to be able to trade cryptocurrency on these exchanges essentially without any of the transaction or gas fees that are so common with blockchain transactions? Join me in today's video where we are talking all about the Omnibus wallet model of cryptocurrency storage. Hey everyone and welcome back. This is the part-time economist and in today's video we are talking all about the Omnibus wallet how it works, some of the advantages. It's going to be a deep dive video, so fair warning right up front, it is going to be longer than some of the normal videos. I will do my best to put timestamps so you can kind of skip through some of the parts that you already know or don't really apply to you. Obviously not financial advice. And then the last disclaimer that I want to give, I don't know why, but there's a confidential watermark on some of the slides. I'm literally just using um, Google Slides a free template so there's no insider information no confidential information you don't have to worry about any of that so with that being said let's jump right into the agenda today we're going to explain what an omnibus wallet is how it works and then we're going to compare that to the segregated uh, model that some I don't know, want to say that a lot of crypto exchanges use it, but it's kind of a, a standard of comparison for us to kind of compare segregated model versus the omnibus model, just so you can see the differences about how those two work. We'll start off with the big picture overview here. What an omnibus wallet does is it pools assets into a single joint account at the wallet blockchain level, but with individual positions maintained on the company's internal records. Okay, what does that even mean? Essentially, think of it this way. I am the part-time economist, crypto custody corporation. And what I do is I store people's Bitcoin for them. Now, I could just as easily be an exchange, right? And help people trade crypto, but it makes the example easier if we think about me just storing it for them at first. So Joe wants to store his crypto. So under the segregated model, what I could do is say, Joe, you send your crypto to this address. Sally, you send yours to that address. Fred, send yours to that address. Now, this is a simplistic, intuitive approach that essentially keeps everyone's funds separate. I know exactly how much Sally owns because this is her wallet. I know how much Joe owns because that is his wallet. If there's some kind of a hack, one wallet is going to be hacked. It sucks for Joe, but it doesn't suck for Sally or Fred or Steve. They're not really affected. So the segregated model is, you know, like I said, I don't really know how many companies actually use it, but it's kind of a starting point to explain the omnibus model. The omnibus model does not do that. We don't give different people different addresses. What we do is we say, hey, I don't care who you are, just send all your crypto to this single wallet address on the blockchain. So I own the part-time economist crypto custody corporation. We have one wallet and we're saying one for now. We'll expand that later on. But for now, just assume we have one wallet. Everyone, Joe, Steve, Fred, Sally, they all send their crypto to the exact same wallet. So it's a joint wallet at the blockchain level. So on the blockchain, we have 100 Bitcoin assigned to this single address. But on the firm, on you know me as a custodian, I say, okay, out of these 100, Joe owns five, Sally owns 10, Steve owns three. So it's up to me to keep track of who owns what. Um, obviously, with only one wallet, right, the possibility of a hack, right, that's something that we're worried about because now someone can take all the crypto, not just one. And we'll, we'll go through those concerns later in the video, but I just wanted to explain it so you've got a heads up as we're going through this. The next portion of the video, you can skip. Um, it's going to be kind of a detour talking about the Depository Trust Clearing Corporation, just giving an example. If you're not interested in that, you want to get right to the video, just skip the next section. But for those of you who are interested, I wanted to start off with a story that can kind of explain a historic parallel to the Omnibus wallet and some of the advantages. So 
Back in the day in the United States when people would trade stocks, right? They would actually trade physical paper stock certificates. If you went to a fancy place like a doctor's office or a lawyer, you might see them having a stock certificate hanging on their wall. Now it's kind of a cool thing. It's a novelty. And there's a reason for that because it was an incredibly inefficient way of actually trading stocks. Because what would happen is when you wanted to sell Coca-Cola or buy Coca-Cola, your broker dealer would take your order. They would find, you know, they would send it through the market. Once they found a buyer or seller, they would actually have to take a pile of stock certificates, physically move them to another broker dealer, right? In some cases, this could take up to five business days. So it was incredibly inefficient. It slowed things down and there were a lot of errors. Things got lost. I mean, you just think about it. You're moving all this paper around. Stuff's going to get lost. All kinds of different things can happen, which ended up leading to something known as the paperwork crisis. They were so far behind. Things were getting lost and they said, okay, we've got to change things. So funny story, but now in the United States, virtually every share of publicly traded stock is owned by a single corporation known as Seed and Company. And you're probably thinking, no, 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 I own shares. I have my brokerage account. I see that I own Amazon or Tesla or whatever. But in reality, you have a claim on those shares. So to simplify things, virtually every publicly traded share is owned by Seed and Company, which is um, Depository Trust Clearing Corporation, I think. The acronym, the name doesn't really matter. Um, it's what they do that matters, but they own all the stock, right? Let's just make things simple. Assume they've got 100 shares of Walmart. Now you're saying, I own Walmart in my IRA, right? You do, but it's owned by Seed and Company. And what Seed and Company does is they say, okay, we've got all these broker dealers. We've got uh, Merrill Lynch, we've got Schwab, we've got Vanguard, we've got Fidelity. Vanguard owns five shares, uh, Fidelity owns 10, Schwab owns 36, right? Whatever the case is. So they actually own, and this is where we're getting into the Omnibus wallet. It's very similar in that all the crypto is in one address, all the shares are in one address. What Seed and Company does is they say, all right, or sorry, DTCC, they say, Fidelity owns this much, Vanguard owns that much, and then Vanguard says, okay, we've got 10 shares assigned to us, Sally owns one of them, Fred owns two of them. So the cool thing now, when you go to buy and sell shares, it's a two-day settlement. They don't actually move those paper certificates anymore unless, again, it's a novelty. You order one to hang on your wall. They don't really do that anymore. Um, so with that being said, all we have to really do is say, if I'm doing a trade, okay, I'm going to decrease Sally's account by five, you know, just a little bookkeeping entry, and Joe's account is going to go up by five because she sold, he bought. It's so much simpler because instead of physically moving these things, we just do a bookkeeping entry. Yes, there's more that goes into it than that, but that's essentially the premise. We can just move things on an internal system or across firms. So... That brings us to the problems that Omnibus wallets are designed to solve. First off, they're designed to have a smaller number of key pairs, right? So if we're assigning everyone a specific address, that's more key pairs to manage. If I'm the security manager, I've got to keep track of 10,000 or 100,000 different key pairs under the segregated model because everyone has their own uh, blockchain wallet. I've got to monitor and make sure that nothing's getting hacked, that an employee isn't kind of sending funds out of those. If I'm only managing five or 10 addresses, it's easier for me to keep track of. Uh, we can bundle transactions, right? If we've got a lot of people that want to sell or buy crypto, if everyone has a separate wallet, that's a separate blockchain transaction. If we have a pooled wallet, I can bundle those transactions and just use my internal accounting to determine who owns what, and then we can enhance privacy. We'll go through examples of each of those in the video moving forward. The first thing I want to go through is a simple model using the segregated storage approach. And again, like I said, segregated approach isn't what we're focused on in this video. It's the starting point for comparison. So let's suppose I am the part-time economist crypto custody corporation, and I've got my first three customers. Joe wants to store 100 Ethereum with me. 
Fred wants to store 0.25 and Alex wants to store 10. What I do is I create um, a separate crypto wallet for each of them. I say, Joe, send your crypto to this wallet. Fred, you're going to that wallet. Alex, send it to this wallet. That way, if there's a hack, only one of you will get hacked. And on top of that, um, there's no chance of me confusing who owns what. So far, everything is good, right? No big issues there. But let's suppose that Joe says, hey, Ethereum is going to crash. I need to sell five ETH. Fred says, you know what? He's got paper hands over here. He's like, this crypto stuff, it's just going down. It's not for me. Just, just sell me out. Just give me my cash. And then Alex says, hey, you know, I like this crypto stuff, but I need to sell some Ethereum to make some home repairs. Now, if we look at each person's sell order, it adds up to a total of 10 Ethereum, right? So 10 Ethereum is going to be leaving the part-time economist crypto uh, custody corporation. But because each of those bits of crypto is in a separate wallet address, I've got to do three separate transactions that I'm sending to the blockchain. I'm sending a separate transaction for Joe's 5 Ethereum. I'm sending 0.25 for Fred, and then of course Alex is doing his 4.75, so three separate transactions. Now, although the segregated model is intuitive and simple, we see some immediate drawbacks here. Three times the gas fees. Not only that, but if we're thinking about security, that's three times that we're connecting to the network, it's three times that we're coming out of cold storage, it's three keys that someone has access to potentially stealing or using for their own purposes. There's no ability to bundle transactions, so we know 10 Ethereum is leaving our storage company, but we've got to do three separate transactions. We can't just bundle it and send um, one transaction. We can't cross transactions either. Don't worry about that for now. We'll talk about it later, but just know that we can't cross transactions in this example either. Now, let's look at it differently. Let's suppose now we're using the Omnibus wallet. When people are sending us the crypto, we don't give them each a separate wallet. We say, hey, I'm the part-time economist crypto clearing company. I'm trustable. Just send it all to the same wallet address. So they send it all to the single wallet address. And now it's not divided at the blockchain level. It's all in one blockchain wallet. 110.25 ETH. Same thing happens. They all want to sell for their various reasons. Now what we do because this is all in one wallet, we only have to submit one blockchain transaction for the full amount. So before this transaction, Joe owned 100 Ethereum, Fred was at 0.25, Alex was at 10. We submit one total transaction for 10 Ethereum. All we do is on our internal uh, records, our database, we submit that 10 total transaction, but we just decrease each person's balance by the amount that they sold. So Joe sold five, Fred sold his full amount of 0.25, Alex um, sold the 4.75 to get down to 5.25. So one transaction, we save gas fees, we only have to worry about managing one private key, and we just do the adjustments internally. So that's an example of how we can bundle transactions. I also want to go through the example of crossing transactions. Crossing transactions allows us to essentially, if someone wants to buy and someone wants to sell, we don't necessarily have to route both of those orders to the market. We can just, hey, you want to buy, you want to sell, let's just switch, right? Um, Within traditional stocks, it's, it's regulated. There's a lot that goes on. It's not as big of a deal. Um, but with crypto, where you're paying transaction fees every time, if we can prevent two blockchain transactions and the associated fees and just kind of switch things on a spreadsheet, um, can be more beneficial to the customer. So we've got Joe here. He says, hey, this Ethereum, it's really cool, but I've got to take some profit. Let me sell one ETH. Fred, he's like, you know, all my friends, they're talking about crypto. I kind of want to get into it. Let me buy one Ethereum. If we are having a segregated wallet structure, right? So Joe's got his, um, Fred has his, even though they are both our customers, even though they are both with the same company, we have no way, even if we want to cross those orders, we can't do it without submitting blockchain transactions because we can't move assets on the blockchain without sending it through the blockchain. So what we've got to do is essentially two separate blockchain transactions, ETH for cash, cash for ETH, right? Um, 
Now, if we pool all of these assets, again, just a huge wallet where all the Ethereum is pooled together, all we have to do in this example is we say, okay, you want to sell some Ethereum, you want to buy some Ethereum. The part-time economist crypto wallet, it still has the same amount of Ethereum in it. There's no need to submit a blockchain transaction. All that we need to do is decrease on our internal ledger. Um, Joe, his balance of Ethereum needs to go down by one. His cash balance needs to go up by the price of one Ethereum. Fred, his cash balance goes down by the price of one Ethereum. His balance of Ethereum goes up by one. So essentially, we don't even need any blockchain transactions there. We save fees. We literally just make a, uh, a switch on our internal databases. One other thing that I do want to point out, and this is an overlooked advantage of the Omnibus wallet model, is privacy. So we've got Joe. He is very rich, but he's also very humble and likes his privacy, and he doesn't want people to know how much cryptocurrency he owns. But one day he says, you know, I'm really big into martial arts. I need to order, you know, some ninja stars, a punching bag, maybe a cool little outfit. So what he does is he comes to us, the part-time economist crypto uh, custody company, and he says, hey, can you send five Ethereum to these ninjas so they'll send me stuff? And we say, of course, we're happy to do that for you. Now, when we send out that crypto to the ninjas, they're going to see, okay, this is an order for Joe, and Joe is paying us, and this payment is coming from a specific blockchain address. Because remember, under the segregated model, each person has their own address. So even though they can't get into his account, they see, oh, look, Joe is paying us from this address. So now they know not only how much Joe owns, but they also know these are all Joe's transactions. Um, obviously, I should say here, this is just a random address I found on Etherscan. Um, don't have to worry about Joe's information actually getting leaked here. So no worries there. This is just a random address that I found. And let's contrast that with the Omnibus model. So now we don't have Joe. We don't have Fred. We don't have Alex. We have part-time economist crypto. So when Joe says, hey, send payment to these ninjas, these ninjas see it, but it comes from the part-time economist corporation, right? So they can see every transaction that part-time economist corporation is making, but we're a publicly traded corporation. We don't care. They don't care. Joe's actual balances are hidden from them because they are all internal to us. So it protects his privacy because all those funds are just coming out of the corporate account and we're maintaining his balance on a private protected internal ledger. So checkpoint before we move on. If you want to stop this video now, you can. Um, essentially, omnibus models reduce on-chain interactions, thus protecting the number of times that we've got to go online, make transactions. They reduce gas fees. Um, they allow us to consolidate private keys, and they allow crossing transactions. If you want to stick around for the rest of the video, I'm going to briefly cover some of the objections to the omnibus model, specifically that you're putting all your eggs in one basket. And intuitively, this makes a lot of sense because if that one private key gets hacked, the entire corporation, everyone's funds are at risk, right? That's what you would think. In reality, omnibus models do not mean there is one private key, right? That's the example we use, but in reality, most companies will chunk private keys, right? So, we're not using the segregated model where everyone has their own separate wallet. We're saying, okay, anyone that's sending in Bitcoin, put your funds here. Now, a pure kind of omnibus would be there's one wallet. In reality, um, that's not necessarily always the case. We might say, hey, you 500 customers, put your funds in this wallet. Okay, we've reached a 10 million cap per wallet. Or you could you could divide it up however you wanted. I'm going to have a wallet cap of 10 million, a wallet cap of 5 million, of 1 million, you know, whatever the case is. Within that wallet, we still have a large amount of customers that we can bundle transactions, we can cross transactions, we can do all those things. But because we're chunking it, we don't have each customer has their own private key um, and we have to keep track of all that. We're consolidating keys, but we're just having a smaller number. So we've got 5, 10, 15 instead of tens and hundreds of thousands, right? So 
it's a little bit of a spectrum. Um, when we think of the omnibus wallet model, I don't want you to specifically think there's only one wallet. Think of at some level, right? And the degree to which this is pooled is going to vary by company. At some degree, funds are pooled by customers. It might literally be every customer is pooled together, or it could be customers are pooled by groups of a million, 10 million, 100 million, whatever uh, the case might be there. On top of that, I really do want to reiterate the difficulty of cracking a private key, right? So I'm not talking about you accidentally send your private key somewhere. Literally just guessing a private key is incredibly, incredibly difficult. The fewer private keys we have, the easier it is to keep track of has any unauthorized activity occurred, um, especially with these crypto custodians. The level that they go to as far as, you know, multiple people having to sign transactions, how these private keys are safeguarded is far beyond what the average user at home is likely to do. Um, so that's just kind of one of the key objections to the omnibus model. And again, like I said, I'm not saying that it's the best model or that it's better or worse, just really trying to explain how it works and the pros and cons. Um, but as always, I do appreciate you watching the video. I hope you found it useful and I'll see you next time.